let me, uh, let me just talk to you a little bit about choices. You know, we live in a world where we love choice. Let me just ask you, how many of you love choice? You like, have, you like going to a buffet kind of thing? You like choices? You like, you know, choices at a movie house? There's different things to see. We love choices. You know, we don't like going somewhere where it's like, okay, this is what you get. You just get this one item, or you can watch this one movie, or you can get this one TV channel or something like that. There have been times in my life where I have lots of choices. There have been times in my life where I've had very few choices. I thought about that as I was kind of looking at this sermon. And, and trying to put everything together. You know, we live in America where we have so many choices, it's almost impossible to choose. Like, how many of you have this argument? You get ready to leave and you say, where would you like to go to eat, right? <laughs> I don't even have to say the rest of it. Sean's like, I'm there, brother, I'm there. It's not the altar call yet, just yet, all right? Some of us are in that situation where we say, where would you like to go to eat? And you go, I don't care wherever you want to go. And I don't care where you go. Well, there's so many choices. Well, I can't decide, you decide. And pretty soon you just have an argument argument over where you're going to go to eat, right? You know, some of you been there. I've been there, you know. I intentionally choose things that I know Michelle will not go to just to force her to choose, you know. She says, I don't care. And I'll be like, okay, let's go to Chinese because that's what I love. And, and she doesn't really like it. She goes, I don't want to go there. I was like, well, then choose. I, I chose Chinese, you know. And we do that. I do that sort of thing there. And yet somehow she still loves me and stayed married to me. I, I don't know. But anyway, you know, we have all kinds of choices. I began to think about this. You think about like going to shop for a car. Now, 30 years ago, maybe, maybe even a little more than that, you think about going to a car lot, there might have been 20, 30 cars. Maybe if a car lot had 50 cars, like that was a lot of cars on a car lot. Now you can go to a car lot and there's hundreds of cars. There might even be a thousand different cars there, you know? I mean, it's huge, Southwest Florida. It's huge, right? You know, there's so many cars, so many colors, so many options and models and different things to choose from. It's like, how do you settle down on one thing? And we love to go to the buffet, you know? You go to Golden Corral now. They just keep adding more main meat, which is what I love. I skip the salad. Why do you go to a buffet? buffet place to get salad is beyond me. I go there for one thing and that is meat, okay? And so you go there and you got about five or six main meats and then you got like, you know, a dozen different side items and you got about 20 some different desserts there. And like, how can you choose? And, and you know, if you're like me, my eyes are bigger than my stomach and I choose more than what I possibly could eat. But we love to have choice. And when we don't have choice, it annoys us. Now, when we were in India, we didn't have choice. It was roasted chicken or roasted chicken. And we got so tired of roasted chicken and boiled vegetables. And so when we finally got back to the, to the, to the airport there, the subway was there. It might have been the first time I was with Don, but with the same feeling. We got to, the, to there, and I was like, oh, subway, a choice of meat. I got there, and it was still chicken. I was like, ah, oh, I could not have chicken sandwich, but at least there was some vegetables that I recognized, lettuce and tomato. So I go through and I'm telling him, and he gets down and he asks me, do you want meat or do you want cheese? And I said, what kind do you have? He said, do you want cheese? I was like, well, what kind? Then he holds up the cheese to me and he says, do you want cheese? I'm like, oh, I get it. It's cheese or no cheese. I mean, that's all there was, you know. It wasn't a choice of cheese. I'm like, man, this is, they would never fly in America here, you know. You need to have pepper jack cheese. You need to have Swiss cheese. You need to have American cheese. I mean, if all you got is just cheese or no cheese, that's not even Subway. I mean, it's like, it's heresy or something. But anyway, so I learned that it was just a choice. You know, I think that's the way it is with God. That it's either for God or against God. There's not this dozens of choices you can choose. Either you are for God or you're against God. And Jesus, I think, is trying to illustrate that as he wraps up the Sermon on the Mount. You think about all the things that he's been teaching, and you can go back, and he starts off with the Beatitudes, right, and salt and light, and how we're to influence the world. And he starts going through the murder issues, adultery issues, divorce issues. We went through all those different things, prayer, fasting, and all that. But as he's boiling all that teaching down, it comes to a point. Either you do what God has taught you, or you don't. Either you follow the Word of God, or you don't. There's not somewhere in the middle you know, we live in a world where we think everything is a gray area. That there are no standards. What's right for you may not be right for me. And what's wrong for you might not be wrong for me. And so everything just sort of goes. But that's not how it is in the Bible. There is God's standards and there are the world's standards. There's God's way and everything else. And we need to understand that if we're to get through this life pleasing the Lord with a salvation in our hearts, then we need to do things God's ways. 
Jesus tells us three stories here in the end as he illustrates his concept of either we are accepting the lordship of Christ or we are rejecting it. On the back of your bulletins, a small outline. I'll give you the main fill-ins. I'll say two or three things you can maybe write in as we go through these very familiar stories. But I want us to see them grouped together. I've preached on them before where they're separated out. You've done Bible studies and stuff that way. But I want to group them together because I think that they tie together. There's a series of two. Let's start in chapter 7 in verse 13. Jesus is speaking, right? And he says, enter through the narrow gate for, the, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Number one, write this down, there are only two pathways. As Jesus is talking, there are only two pathways. In fact, this, uh, pa this uh, verse here, uh, we had painted on the wall uh, in our children's wing here, and that was our concept. That's why we made this road down here. Some of you were here when we took all that carpet up and we laid that tile down. And that next Sunday, like the noise volume just drastically went up as all those kids ran down there. I was like, oh, that was not a smart decision. So, but yeah, you can blame that one on me. And uh, so I was like, man, that was so loud. But the whole idea was... Was, what pathway are we leading our children down? Narrow is the road, the scripture says. Wide is this one path, but narrow is the road that leads there. The wide path is popular, but it does not lead to the presence of God. The wide path, as I read through this text here, it's clear that it is popular. That's why he describes it as being wide, but it doesn't lead to the presence of God. Just because everyone is going a certain direction doesn't mean that that direction ends up in a good place. You know what I'm saying? You know, following a crowd doesn't mean that you're following them to the right place. And I wrote down at least three areas. You can maybe write these down as some sub points if you want, in which we follow wide pathways, but they don't lead to the presence of God. Number one is this, political opinion does not trump biblical directives. Whatever the politics are in our nation, that doesn't trump what the Bible says. It does not trump what God commands. I do not care what justices rule. I do not care what a president says. I don't care what a house of Congress will pass. If they are outside of the word of God, they're wrong. Political opinion does not matter. And we're in a political fervency right now as we get ready to gear up for the election of another president and everyone's got their opinions and they're going down different ways and they're making their different camps. I don't care if you're on the left side of the aisle or the right side of the aisle. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Political opinion never trumps the word of God, ever. We are, we're, we are moving into a world right now where we are, going to be, we are going to find out what Christians, which Christians rather, really believe that the word of God is the word of God. There will be churches that will capitulate to what the state says. There will be preachers who will capitulate to what the state says. There will be Christians who will capitulate to what the state says. And we are going to live in a time where we are going to have to stand up and make our voices heard and say, no, we stand on the word of God regardless of what the politics say in our country. It angers me to no end. I got all worked up Wednesday night talking about this when I think about how stupid our government officials are when they talk about things like the right to life and the sanctity of human life and marriage and they try to divide to, to describe it in all sorts of legalese. I'm like, just use your stinking brain. My grandma used to say, just use what God give you. And I want to tell that if you would just use what God has given you and think for yourself, you would understand that we are so far away from where God intended for us to be. Politics do not trump biblical directives. Number two is this. Democracy, as great as an idea as it is, does not negate God's decrees. Just because you get enough people to vote for something, that does not negate what God says. We have had many things in the, in the history of our country, laws that we have enacted because we had enough people vote for them, but it doesn't make it God's way. And we need to understand that. We seem to, and I'm all for democracy. I think it's a great thing, but it is not better than the commands of God. The commands of God stand above just the number of votes collected on any one issue there. So we need to be careful about that and not just say, well, it's the rule of people. I'm like, no, what does God's word say? The people ought to be following God's word and implement God's word on their lives. Number three is this popularity of thought does not equate to righteousness. 
Just because it's the newest fad, it's the most popular idea out there, that does not mean that it is a righteous act before God. We have so many things that are coming down the pike. The newest wave that we're trying to ride, the newest fad that we're trying to do, the newest popular whatever it is. Pop culture seems to be driving our world. People know more about pop culture than they do know about their own government. Then they know about things that are going on in the world. I mean, you look at it. You think about how many millions of people will vote for American Idol that will not vote for government uh, elected officials. We vote for stupid stuff like that, and we don't vote for things that are important, and we wonder why is our nation going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, because we are so, ta- so tied up in popularity things. Pop culture stinks. It doesn't drive anything. What's cool today is not cool tomorrow. When are bell bottoms ever going to come back in? again. Seriously, some of you are trying to bring it back, but it ain't working very well, right? Culottes are never going to come back around again. Parachute pants, red leather jackets, spiked, you know, speckled hand gloves, all that, Michael Jackson stuff. It's all gone, folks. It ain't coming back, right? Popularity does not drive and equate to righteousness. Now, the second thing about this pathway is this. The pathway to life is narrow, but I want to say this very clearly, it can be found. Don't ever think that God is hiding himself and he's making it difficult for you to find him. He's not. Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Isaiah would not have said that if there wasn't a chance for people to find God. God is not trying to to hide himself and keep people at a distance. He wants people to find him. He wants people to call on his name. He wants people to search after him. That's why we talked about seek and you'll find. Knock, the door will be open. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Why? God wants you to be involved in seeking him and he wants to be involved in your life. The pathway of righteousness is not always the most popular. It is not always the most flashy. It is not always the most attractive to the world, but it is always, always visible to to creation. Now, let me tell you how I know that. Because if you were to go to the book of Romans, and within the first three chapters, Paul deals with three issues. One, he deals with those who should have known God by revelation. They received the word of God, and he's talking to the Jews. You had revelation from God, and yet you rejected it, and you did not know God. Then he talks about those who should have known God through creation. He says that you should have recognized that there is a a creator God because of the creation, but you rejected the creator God, and you worship the creation. And then he comes to chapter 3, and he says, therefore, everyone has sinned, whether by revelation being rejected, rejected or creation being rejected. The point is this, Paul is saying that no matter where you are in this world, no matter who you are, what social economic circumstances you have been born into, you can know that there is a God out there simply by looking at the heavens. The heavens declare the majesty of God, the Bible says, or by the revelation if you've been blessed to be in a nation where the word of God is freely read. Man is without excuse. God can be Found, And that's what I understand as Jesus says, narrow is the path, but it is found. There are some that find that path. We can find that path. That path, though, will always seem foolish to the world. It will always seem foolish to the world. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 says this, But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. When you make a stand for Jesus Christ, someone's going to make fun of you. Guaranteed it. Make a stand in school, someone's going to make fun of you. Make a stand on the workplace, someone's going to harass you. Make a stand in a political arena, someone's going to take a pot shot at you. You know, and you're going to be some Bible thumper, some right-wing radical, or whatever it is. That's fine. Jesus tells us that, you know, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Don't think that that's, don't think that that's weird or out of the norm. That's the way it should be. Understand this, that the ways of God will always seem foolish to the world, but to those who are being saved, it is a power on to God. Amen. It is what drives us. Now, let me give you a personal illustration to kind of bring this all together. I had a chief warrant officer, third class, in charge of me when I was in the Marine Corps, and he used to drive me nuts. And, uh, and I, so I was a sergeant. I had to listen to what he had to say. And so I just, I just kind of, you know how it is. You just bite the bullet and grin and bear it and get through it and that sort of thing there. I thought at some point I'm going to get out of here. I'm, I'm going to be under somebody else. He overheard me having a conversation with some other Marines about the church and God and my relationship and tithing. I was talking about tithing because there was something that Michelle and I wanted to be a foundational thing of our marriage when we 
uh, got married, and so we started to tithe in the little church in Jacksonville. And he heard that conversation, and he decided to interject. And so he starts talking to me, he really starts chastising me, and calling me down, and telling me how dumb I am and everything, and how I was jeopardizing the future of my family, my wife, and any children I might have, because I was taking that money, and I was tithing to the church, instead of saving that money and putting it away for uh, college for my kids, or something like that. Finally, I knew I had him on a grounds where he knew nothing about this subject. I mean, I, I, was like, I knew he did not know what he was talking about here, because he wasn't talking from the Word of God. And finally, I said to him, I said, answer me this. I think it's more important that my children would grow up knowing the word of God, come to a saving relationship with Jesus, and that I would see them in eternity than to save up some money and send them off to college and let them have the highest education I could give them and make the most amount of money. Now, what do you think? He didn't have an answer for that. Because I was absolutely right. I'm not against education. I, we need education. We need to, to, God calls us to work, at, work uh, uh, at making our world better. And being better educated helps us to do that. But education is not a means in the, all of itself. It's not the end. The end game is when I see Jesus, do I know him? And I will know him if I keep his church healthy and I keep his word being preached. And that's what I saw was more important in my life was my children learn to honor and respect the Lord. We have to understand that that pathway seems foolish to some people. If you talk about that to somebody now, they would think you're foolish to give to the church. They would think you're foolish to tithe to the work of God. They would think you're foolish to spend three or four hours a week in, in church services and hearing some guy stand up and preach and, and people just sing some songs and, and everybody have a kumbaya moment. You have foolishness. But you know what? To those who have found salvation, it is the lifeblood of our week. When I'm not in church, I'm missing something. When I'm traveling, I miss being here. That pathway is narrow, but it can be found. Now, number two, let's look at the next story. In verse 15, it says this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruits, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by your fruit, you will, be rec you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, he says, that I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Now, number two, write this down. There are only two types of people. As we look through this passage, there are only two pathways and there are only two types of people here. Those two types of people are this. You're either a friend of God or you're an enemy of God. You're not somewhere in between. You're either a friend of God or you're an enemy of God. There have always been two-faced people in this world who try to be more than what they are. We call them what? What do we call a two-faced person? We call them a what? Uh, we call them a hypocrite. It comes from a Greek word that was used to describe the Greek actors in a, in a drama because they would wear like a mask and a costume. And so the mask and the costume would, would be projecting something else, maybe a smiling face or a sad face or whatever. And there was someone behind that mask who was sort of portraying what was going on. And so the Greeks understood that. And they, and they, and they, and they make a word that we get the word hypocrite from. And it was an idea of basically being two-faced. What I see and what's behind behind there are not the same. And, and there are a lot of Christians who try to do that. Who, 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 who try to be one thing and yet they're not. And Jesus is dealing with that in this very text here. He says, right, watch out for some false prophets. They come to you and here's the two-faced part of it, right? They're sheeps. They, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They look all cuddly and nice on one side, but inside they have a ferociousness to destroy you. There's a huge problem, I think, within the church of people not being who they say they are. We live in such a false world. Advertising is false, 
right? They only project the highest and the best of a product, but they never tell you about the negative side of things. Let me just throw it out for an example. I like the, the Budweiser commercials of the Clydesdale horses because I think they're beautiful. And you can watch them, you know, going through the, he- going through the snow and the bells jingling and all that. Sort of, and that's all wonderful. But they don't show you someone dying of cirrhosis of the liver. They don't show someone who got drunk and just ran themselves into a pole or just killed a family because they were drunk driving. They don't show you the negative side of those different things there. You know, we live in a world where we just want to see all the positive. We don't want to see the negative. But folks, there's a negative side to things. And there's some Christians who come in and they sit in pews and they sing songs and they put some money in the, in the, in the plate and, and maybe they're up on stage and maybe they're preaching. And, and they look like one thing, but what they are on the inside is very, very different. Jesus says, you need to be aware of these people. So how do you know the difference? You know them by their fruit, he says. And then he goes through this analogy, right, about fruit trees and that sort of stuff there. And we understand that, right? You know, you're not going to get oranges from a grapefruit tree. You're not going to pick grapes off of an orange tree. You're not going to get apples off an orange tree. An orange tree produces oranges. An apple tree produces apples. A peach tree produces peach trees. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. And not only is it the type of fruit that is produced, but the quality of the fruit says something about it. I can, look at the qual- I can look at the type of fruit in a person's life. The Bible tells us what? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no limitation, right? We all look at that in our lives and say, do they demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? And then if they do, then we ought to look at the quality. How loving are they? How patient are they? How in self-control are they? Because that determines the spiritual maturity of a person person. Jesus says we need to be looking at that stuff. We are recognized very clearly by those acts there. Claiming the title of Christian is not the same as being a disciple of Christ. It is very, very different. Claiming a title is not the same as being a disciple of Christ. Corey Ten Boone, the Holocaust survivor, wrote this, putting a mouse in the cookie jar does not make him a cookie. Just sitting in a church, just singing a Christian song, that does not make you a Christian. And as I read this text, coming down to the end of that story, it seems to me that it is more important that Christ knows you than you knowing about him. Because Jesus says, away from me, I never knew you. We are so wrapped up in, do I know God? There's lots of people who know about Jesus. They know about God. They've heard about his name. They could quote passages in the Bible. But Christ does not know them as a disciple. Christ does not know them as a child of God. Christ does not know them as someone who is saved and in the kingdom of God. Now, let me illustrate this for you. There's something that happened while I was living in Maysville, Kentucky. There was a race that was happening. I think it was called the Great American Race or something. It was a reenactment of the early days of racing, auto racing, when cars really almost didn't make it from beginning to the end. And they were racing from California going somewhere to to the East Coast. Maybe it was in New York. I don't know. But they happened to come right through our little town in Maysville, Kentucky, and they stopped and they had a car show. While they were there, the Roush Racing Team, how many of you know about the Roush Racing Team from NASCAR and that sort of stuff? Roush Racing Team was sponsoring a car and Mr. Roush was there and my friend Bob had come to my dad and he said, hey, Mr. Roush is going to be here. I want you to take a picture of us together. Well, he made it sound like he and Mr. Roush were personal friends because this guy was in boat racing and all kinds of different stuff, and he knew everybody. So I thought, well, maybe he knows them. But this is what he did. Let's just say this microphone here is, is Mr. Roush. And so my friend Bob, he tells my dad, here's the camera. He's like, okay. And he get over and he go, wait, wait, wait. Oh, take a picture. And Mr. Roush is over here talking to some people, doesn't even know my friend's Bob there, and he'd move, and then Bob would go, wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, now take, no, no, no. Take a picture. You know, like he had no idea who he was. And so he was, he was acting like he was friends with him, and he's going to have this picture and be like, hey, I got me and Mr. Roush in a picture together. But he doesn't know him. He couldn't care if he was there or not. Wouldn't know him by name or nothing bothered him. You know, some of us do that with Christ. We go, oh, hold on, get, take a picture. I'm in church. Oh, I take a picture. I'm in the choir. Oh, you know, I mean, but you have no relationship with Jesus. Take a picture. I'm holding my Bible. Take a picture. I got the crucifix on the wall. Take a picture. And, and we try to get next to Christ. Being next to Christ is not the same as following Christ. Am I getting through? Am I making the point there? We meet people like that. That is not the same. Wearing the name of Christian and being a follower of Christ are very, very different. 
Paul just talked about that. We looked, about, we looked at this in our Wednesday night study where there were two people that left him, right? Hymenaeus was one of them. We talked about how they, they were with Paul for a while, but they left, they, they, they fell away. Not everyone who sits in a pew, not everyone who sings is a follower of Christ. And Jesus is saying, you need to watch out for that. You need to watch out for that. Now, let's look at our third story. In verse 24 and following. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built a house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Number three, write this down. Wisdom is not about how much knowledge of God you possess, but rather how much of God's word you actually apply to your life. Wisdom is not just about the, the amount of knowledge of God that you possess, but it's about how much knowledge of God you actually apply to your life. This is something that we really had to teach on and guard against when I was in Bible college, because in Bible college, the Bible becomes a textbook. I know it shouldn't be that way. I know that sounds bad to say that, but it really does. Because you're sitting in classes and you're talking about Jesus' ministry and his parables and his miracles and Paul's letters and, you know, what was going on and everything. And you're memorizing passages and, it very, and you're reading very much to, to get an answer on a test. And I remember a professor, I don't know his name, but I know that it was in class when I heard him say it. He said this, he said to the students there, he said, if you think that you're going to get involved in a church after you graduate. You're going to wait until you graduate to get involved in ministry. It will never happen. You need to be involved in ministry now. And so many people thought, well, you know what? When I, when I graduate, then I'll know enough about the Bible that I can go and actually serve in a church. Then I'll have a heart for people. Then I'll have a passion for the Word of God. Then I will, I'll have a drive to want to win souls. When I finally graduate, that's when it'll happen. Let me tell you, it will never happen. You have to have a passion and a drive for people where you are now. Even here sitting in, in the church, you think, well, you know, when I finally hear enough sermons, I'll feel, I'll feel adequate to serve in this area. When I finally go through enough Sunday school classes, then maybe I'll teach a class. When I finally sit through enough worship services, maybe I'll get up and have a prayer. Maybe I'll get up and do a communion meditation. It'll never happen. You don't have to know all of the word of God to tell what you do know. If you've been saved, tell your story about grace. Tell your story about how God loved you. Tell what you do know. You don't have to wait to the end. You need to move now. That's where wisdom is. It's applying what you do know. Not waiting someday till I finally get it all figured out because you're never going to get it all figured out. There, you'll never learn everything that's in here. Every time I read the scriptures, I find a new story, a new angle, something I never thought about before because God is speaking to me where I am in life and what I am going through because his word is active. It is alive. It is moving in my soul. And that, I think that's one of the things that we need to understand here is that wisdom is actually putting this into practice. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. Those who hear my words and put them into practice is like two people. One is wise and one is unwise. One builds on a rock, meaning he puts into practice what he knows, and one builds on foolishness and builds on sand, means he builds on something he does not know is certain. Foolishness is not preparing for the future. As I read through this story, the foolishness is he doesn't prepare for the future. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you are going to get out of life alive? <laughs> there ain't a single person in this room. And unless the Lord comes back, oh, I mean, I'm going to just be a downer here. We're all going to die one day, right? And when we do, when we stop breathing here and we start seeing over there, that is a future that we must all prepare for. And when we don't prepare for that, we are being foolish. You know, you think about how stupid it is to be in Florida where we know hurricanes hit and never do anything to prepare for a hurricane. Never have a flashlight, never have a battery, never have a little bit of water set aside, never have a, a plan, never have like our documents that are real important, zip up and pipe. Some of you are really nervous right now, I know. You know, when we know something is going to happen, to not prepare for it is just utter stupidity. 
It's foolishness. We know we're going to die. But we always think, oh, it's somewhere far off. But you don't know when your day is. We just read in the news not too long ago, right? People went to a church service. That guy sat in that church service with them. He listened to that preacher preach the word of God and talk about Jesus and pray. And yet it did not convict his heart. It did not break his heart. And he did a terrible act in murdering those individuals there. I'm sure those people went that day and they never thought today is a day. I'll go see Jesus. But it was their day. I don't know what your day is. I don't know what my day is. But I know that we must prepare for that day. And the choices that you make determine where you will be. So you need to decide, am I going to build on the rock of Jesus Christ, on the foundation that I am sure of, or am I going to build on the things of this world? Because notice this, hard times come to everybody. In that passage there, the rain and the winds and the waters rise to both people. Don't ever think that just because you're a Christian, the rains and the winds and the water will not rise against you because they will. But when you're standing on the rock, you can weather the storm. Now, as Mark comes, let me wrap things up. Let me ask you this question. What choices are you making then? Are you taking that narrow road that leads to life? Or have you fallen after the world's lies and you follow that wide road that leads to destruction? Have you chosen to follow God wholeheartedly? Or have you been living this Christian facade? Where you act like everything is okay, but on the inside you're decaying. Spiritually, emotionally. Have you made Jesus the rock on which you have placed all things? Or are you still trying to lay a base and a foundation by your own strength? I love what the hymn writer says, that the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Your intellect, as smart as you are, will fail you. Your strength, as, as strong as you are, will one day leave you. All of the things that you think you can do on your own, well, one day you will need someone have to help you do those things. And yet we try to build our lives, prepare for an eternity on the things that we can do ourselves. I am learning and have learned, continuing to learn how dumb I really am. Some of you are laughing. I don't know why. Like you've been seeing me or working with me or something. But I recognize my mistakes, I recognize my faults, I recognize my failures, I recognize my shortcomings, I recognize my inability to do the things that God is calling me to do and I need his strength to get through this world. I'm learning that. That's the rock. Now, let me tell you this final story here. Moses, before he died, he gathered the nation of Israel together before God takes him home. And he reads to them the law. And we call that book Deuteronomy. It's the second giving of the law. And at the end of that book, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses says this. This day I call heaven and earth as a witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, Moses boils everything down. The same way that Jesus does. And he says, I'm setting two things before you. This and that. Blessings and cursings. And he goes to so far as to say life and death. And then he tells them, as if they couldn't figure it out, choose life. Choose life. Follow after the things of God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him. Love him. And he will bless you as you go into the land that God has promised you. And I would just say that Jesus was saying the same thing. There's two paths. Take the path that is less travel but leads to righteousness. There, 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 there's two types of fruit. Take the fruit that displays a godly character. You know, that there are two foundations. Take the foundation that will weather the storm. And I would just tell you as a church, true Choose life. Choose life in Jesus Christ because there are only two choices. You're either with him or you're against him. So what is your choice? Let's pray.